Okay, so we're talking about shoulder AC joint separations. Um, and then, so we talked about the different kinds. And now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what to do about it uh, if you if you see it. So, uh, uh, Tayson, what do you think here? I see susceptibility artifact over the uh, coracoclavicular ligament, so I'm guessing there's been a repair. Okay. So, the core cord down here, the distal clavicle up here. Uh, so, this is one way of of uh, treating these if there's significant separation, which is by using a screw that goes between uh, the clavicle and the coracoid process. Uh, I've not seen very many of these. These are very rigid, and uh, most of the people that we work with here uh, use a different kind of technique, uh, which is more of a, well, I think I'll describe it in a minute. Uh, I don't like it. and. Uh... The screw that they use um, has a non-screw type of uh, quarter inch next to the head of the screw that allows it to go up and down a little bit so that uh, uh, that kind of prevents from rigidity. To, but okay. I, and in this area, I don't like it. I like that screw for... Um, for the shoulder in uh, in repair of dislocations, but not for this condition. I, I use a different technique. Okay. I use uh, sutures uh, going through the coracoid process and going up uh, into the clavicle, and, and I've had very good success with that. Uh, one thing about, uh, can, can we go into the children's a little bit, John? I, I'm sorry, what'd you ask? Uh, uh, we didn't cover the children's uh, oh, AC good. separations. Okay, please do. Uh, one, one, one thing that um, the children have uh, is an osteo is a sleeve uh, over the over over the bone of the clavicle. Uh, it's a it's a very thick periosteal sleeve, and so when they dislocate their the clavicle, which I should say, when when a, when a uh, scapula goes down, uh, they do not tear the the coracle, uh, 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 coracle uh, clavicular ligaments. So they get uh, five different dislocations, but uh, the ligaments are not torn. So what they do is they, they, they take the bone and uh, bring it uh, the, the number five, where, which goes through the, the muscles, uh, trapezius, et cetera. Uh, surgically, you have to uh, remove the bone from the, bo uh, the, the bone from the muscle, obviously, and then imbricate the muscle and, and sew, sew up the sleeve uh, over the bone. and. Sometimes that will hold in place at the ASA joint, and sometimes it will not. But uh, if it does not, then you do an adult type of repair. Okay. Thank you, John. I didn't know about that. But that's that's uh, something that's totally different from adults. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, we have a... 49-year-old male, recurrent pain with uh, coracoclavicular repair. Rule out of tear. We see uh, yeah, surgical material, maybe suture anchors in the clavicle and coracoid process. We, see, we certainly see tunnels yes. in the clavicle and the coracoid process here. This is on the uh, T1-weighted image where the fat gives us good contrast. Here's the PD fat set. Uh, where the anatomy is less well uh, seen, but we really don't see a nice black uh, uh, graft across there. Okay. Here are the axial images. Mm. Okay, we're seeing, uh, again, in the coracoid process, that, that tunnel, but then anterior, in the anterior humeral head, 
there's edema. Um, yeah. Unless we there. get the humeral head right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, so we're just looking at the AC joint right now. And then, so here's what the sagittal looks like. Okay, so this material that's, I guess maybe there was a graft that was replacing the corticoclavicular ligament. It looks like it's lax, maybe partially torn, some yeah. increased signal in it. Yeah. So th this actually shows that that mm -hmm. there, that that actually the the original ligament actually reconstituted itself. Okay. Uh, in, in this particular patient. Uh, but I re really couldn't see the graph very well. Uh, uh, sometimes it calcifies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next. All right. So it's a 23-year-old with pain for three months after CC repair and one week after lifting injury, rule out re-tear. Uh, I guess looking at the sagittal images, it looks like there's a lot of indistinctness of that. Yes, where the graft would be, or right, cerebral constructs. So. This is where it would be here as well. Yeah, so I think it's torn. Um, here you can see some metal artifact mm -hmm. in the area where the surgery was performed. Yeah, so it looks like it's come apart. Okay. So here we can see the tunnels for the mm -hmm. two, and then. Here's an axial CT. Uh, is that fractured? Right. Yeah. So one of the complications of the surgery is a fracture of the coracoid process. So what a lot of people will do now is that they make sure if they do put a tunnel in the coracoid, it's a very small tunnel. But often it's what they'll do now is put a fiber tape uh, wrap it around the coracoid process rather than going through the coracoid process, uh, which then uh, is less likely to produce a fracture. So there are a lot of different techniques in this. Uh, John, do you want to comment on this? Um, there, are, there are about 40 or 50 different kind of repairs. You, you can use uh, uh, wires going through the AC joint and connect it to that way with two or three um threaded pins uh, that, that, that usually is uh is uh coracoid uh and uh cla distal clavicle the way it's uh, repaired right where the ligaments are um but uh putting a screw through the uh coracoid is number one not easy to do uh number two it fractures like is you see here, and it's much easier to take a tape or sutures to go around uh, the coracoid process and then um, put a couple of holes in the distal clavicle and tie it, tie it down uh, to proper position um, and, then, and make the AC joint normal. It, uh, many times you have to remove the tissue from the AC joint um, if it's a uh, if there's a problem in there. Thank you. But it, it shouldn't be a difficult procedure, but, uh, but when you start putting drills into the coracoid process, there are a lot of bad stuff right below it. And uh, I've, I've, I've done that procedure, but I never, never, never liked it. Maybe I did one when I was a resident to satisfy the uh, the chief or something, but I, I devised my own method. Okay. Um, on the radiograph, it looks like there's been some sort of repair at that acromioclavicular joint. Yeah. yeah. This patient's not had surgery. Oh. Um, There's probably some widening there. Right in here? Uh, actually, no. Well, what do you think of this? It's a sprain. But what's, what's going on here? 
So the cord cord process would be about down here. Yeah. The clavicle there, the cord cord clavicular ligament should be somewhere in here, right? Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, the AC joint is intact, and uh, that that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Now, the, the, the one little problem here is that there's no motion uh, in that area, so something may happen in the future. But uh, that, this is not terribly uncommon to see this cal calcification. Yeah. Uh, some people just calcify. Uh, I don't think anybody knows why. So, so here it's kind of unusual that we actually see normal AC joints. That's because this is kind of protected because we have really a uh, few uh, ossification of the CC ligament here. Yeah. I had one or two uh, of these after surgery. Um, didn't cause them any problems. Yeah. And this just, again, shows the anatomy. We're talking about the cocochromial ligament here, the trapezoid ligament, which is the lateral of the two components of the CC ligament, the conoid uh, more immediately here, and there's the clavicle. So you can see the CC ligament on these diagrams uh, uh, attaches in kind of a long segment on the clavicle. That's not what I always see on the MR, but... Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, there's separation between the two, but uh, it's uh, not a, not terribly important in the surgical procedure. Okay. You don't do two holes for that. Yeah. All right. So it looks like there's some osseous bridging between the coracoid process and the clavicle. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's congenital or post-traumatic. Okay. So there you can see it. So have a lot of hibernation, uh, kind of a lot of irregularity of the bone here. So the, so this is really a, a pseudo-articulation. Uh, but, but, well, this is... Good. It would be fun to see the other side. Right. It would be. I don't think I have the other side. Let me just check here. So this is... This is the left side, obviously, in 2008. Okay, and here is 2010. All right, well, there's kind of indistinctness of the CC ligament and that pseudo articulation. There's edema. And right, so now you have edema uh, within it. And this just shows kind of the irregularity there. And this is, uh, you have a lot of arthropathy in this particular joint space. And, Mumford procedure. And then they, uh, there is an article here where they they talk about this. It's, it's very uncommon, but you can see a lot of uh, anomalies and pseudo articulations at this joint. Okay, we have a coronal PD fat set. Um, I don't know. I don't see much here. Is there a chondral right. defect there? So, yeah, so we're going on, moving on here. Here we can see the cartilage there. Maybe cartilage up here, if you, but it looks like there's a big defect in between here, mm -hmm. which can be subtle. Here are other images. Uh, showing that same area of the of the defect, mm. and this was uh, yeah, the patient had acute trauma, and uh, let's see what else do you see here? Uh, well, actually, this just shows this would be normal cartilage, and then there the thin cartilage. It's partial volume, so we don't see it really well. But this was an acute post traumatic cartilage defect, mm. and you did need to look for the see where the loose fragment of cartilage is, because you can usually find it if it's an acute injury. You can find it, but you can't always put it where it's supposed to go. That's the problem. Thanks, right. John. So we have a, another coronal of the shoulder, and I guess looking at that cartilage, 
kind of same area, superior medial humeral head. Looks like there's some cartilage loss there. Let's see. Well, if you look down in that uh, at the neck of the surgical neck, mm -hmm. uh, medially, uh, where the fluid is, there's a what what looks a, like a piece of cartilage mm -hmm. right there. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and, uh, it's hard to tell how thick really it is, but uh, I might be able to put it back. I, 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 I wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the displaced fragment. And you can see this patient also has a Hegel lesion. So this patient had a dislocation, which caused the, the fracture of the cartilage and the displaced uh -huh. cartilage, as well as the tear of the inferior capsule and its attachment to the humerus. Look at the delamination plus. So that does not look like an anatomic structure. So not, not the right anatomy anyway. There's a low intense structure in the axillary recess and that might be like a displaced piece of cartilage or yeah, and it might be hmm. So it might be like a uh, like glad type lesion. Or... Well, this is just another. Oh, it's just cartilage type. missing. Okay. And if you go back here, the other thing that you can see on this case is marked thickening of that inferior capsule. So it could be capsulitis. Maybe you, you want to look in the rotator cuff interval to see the patient maybe have a frozen shoulder. But the other thing is that this could be from a prior injury to the inferior capsule, like they might have had an inferior dislocation, at which time they might have uh, torn off the articular cartilage. So the, this is probably due to trauma in this case rather than uh, uh, adhesive capsulitis, and that's the defect. So they can be a little bit subtle, so you kind of have to look for these. And uh, uh, that's so, so, a huge fragment. You should be able to see that a better shot of it on the head. Yeah, I think this is about the. It's coming from the, from the. Uh, I think it's coming from the glenoid in this case. Okay, so now let's go and talk about inflammatory disease. Let's talk about rheumatoid arthritis, bursitis, infection, dermatomyositis, frozen shoulder, and osteoarthritis among other things. Okay. Normal or abnormal? Uh, grossly abnormal. Uh, okay, 78-year-old female, severe chronic shoulder pain. So we have a large uh, effusion with extensive synovitis and uh, multiple areas of erosion on the humeral head. Yes, fronds. And, right. So thinking we have rheumatoid. Yeah. So this is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. In this day and age, hopefully we'll find it earlier and treat it uh, so that you won't see this kind of disease. But on the other hand, you probably will. Okay, we have an 18-year-old. We've got um, sagittal images at the top. Large effusion, uh, synovial thickening, uh, erosive changes on the humeral head. Hmm. Eighteen. Well, could it? Yeah, an arthropathy or inflammatory arthropathy, maybe. So they did a synovectomy, or in fact, uh, it was thirty-two point two, which is elevated, and this is another case of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. It'll grow right back. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the way it 
Yeah, right, John. That's right. Uh, so uh, people got very frustrated trying to do these synovectomies. Now, with uh, proper with medication available, uh, these are really treated medically rather than surgically anymore. Well, has anybody done any studies where where they did a synovectomy and then put them on medication and uh, was successful or? I don't know, John. I'm not up on that. I I haven't seen that study, but uh, you know when I started working with uh, with rheumatoid patients around 2000, uh, right right as the uh, uh, well, the biologic agents came out, the, there was just a, a shift at that time just to treating it medically. So I I would be a little surprised if there are any large studies where they where they did surgical correlation. Certainly, I bet they don't have any randomized studies, but I haven't really looked for that that research, so I don't really know. That that would be be an interesting uh, study. All right, so we have two coronals of the shoulder. It looks like there's a large joint effusion with some synovial debris, kind of axillary recess, maybe. And then some joint space loss and cartilage loss diffusely. So the history behind this patient is that they had a long history of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. These are rheumatoid nodules down here. Uh, but what happens over time is that the, uh, the articular cartilage uh, really gets destroyed. A lot of that is probably due to... Uh, malnutrition uh, and cartilage that's that's uh, is in is being bathed by abnormal synovial fluid but I think there's a lot of debate about that uh, but this is the more end stage where you really have now a lot of osteoarthritis here though the etiology of this uh, is is really primarily destruction of the cartilage from long-standing rheumatoid arthritis or what's now called off that, that, that fluid is that the fluid is very watery it's not normal at all yeah uh, there's a test that we used to do a strength strength test uh it would aspirate the knee and then uh, take the plunger and, and and see how far the fluid will uh drop and and whether there's a produces a strength like effect in other words, it's kind of thick, and and if that's the case, then you don't have RA. Chances are, but if it's like fluid, like water dropping, uh, then then it is R, uh, usually our RA. Thanks, John. And here you we used to do that test, didn't you, John? I heard about it, but I never did it. Oh, okay. No. no. And then here we can see a lot of the synovial thickening uh, in this patient. Let's see who's next? Okay. So maybe like a mild effusion, maybe a little bit of like subacromial, subdeltoid fluid, and then. There's a high signal at like the proximal humeral diaphysis, but I'm not sure. Down here? Yeah. yeah that, that may be in the biceps tendon sheet. Okay. So what do you think this is? Mm. Oh, 49 year old male, pain three year post serving injury. Um, I mean, there's there's some debris within that joint space. And what do you see here? You see a lot of synovial thickening, right? Yeah, so like synovial. Huge, huge, huge. And this is not the case of rheumatoid arthritis. No. Okay. What I really wanted to show here is when you see fluid in the joint space, uh, especially if you do fast suppressed images, you've got to make sure you window and level properly. 
because uh, often the synovium will be very bright. And if you don't window, uh, change your window and levels, you may think it's fluid. But here it's clearly not fluid. That's fluid up here. That's not fluid there. Uh, this is synovial thickening. And here on the T2, you can clearly see that this is different from the fluid. Actually, this is actually all synovial thickening. That's synovial thickening as well. Uh, so this is another area where the T2 can be a little bit helpful uh, because the synovium will be very bright on the PD fat set. But if you window level the PD fat set properly, you'll also be able to differentiate it. Here in this case and other images, it's very clear that you've got Mark's synovitis and you've got all these erosions as well, uh, which goes along with uh, rheumatoid arthritis in this particular patient. Uh, you, you may see fluid also, uh, but it's mixed with a lot of uh, pro proteinaceous material. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, so we have a joint effusion with uh, synov uh, synovial thickening, uh, especially posteriorly. And uh, yeah, some erosions in the posterior uh, medial and intermedial humeral head. Okay, and this is erosive rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, we haven't had the lecture on rheumatoid arthritis yet, but uh, hopefully, this is another case which you hopefully won't see, but you probably will, because uh, uh, erosive changes like this now, uh, we need to make the diagnosis years earlier, and the current medications are actually highly effective in erosive disease and stopping it. And so it really, uh, the, we've really missed the boat if we see it this late anymore. Uh, back when I started out, we didn't really have effective treatment. So even if you made the diagnosis early, the drugs just weren't very effective. Same thing with gout when people missed the boat. Yep. Okay, so here we've got coronal views looking um, not at the AC joint, but I guess more medial, like along the clavicle. Yeah, there's some, yeah, some, maybe some soft tissue thickening there that extends to the subacromial region. Hmm. It's connecting the subacromial fluid, so maybe it's a subacromial bursitis. Right. So this is subacromial bursitis. Okay. And uh, just a little bit of fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid space, I don't think should be interpreted as bursitis. Uh, though if I don't, if that's all I see and you don't see anything else, then you can consider that. And it may be due to repetitive trauma or some uh, uh, you know, kind of outlet impingement and irritation from the, from the acromium. Uh, but when you actually see synovial thickening like this, you can really make the diagnosis of actual true bursitis, uh, which is uh, uh, really caused by some inflammation. And the two things you have to think about really are rheumatoid arthritis and infection. So in case, cases like this, if, if, there's, if this is the only joint involved, then you have to be really concerned that it's an infection. If other joints are involved, then rheumatoid arthritis has to be considered. Uh, and and it, But in either case, if this is what you find, it really needs to be worked up. Most of the time when we call subacromial bursitis, you have uh, thin layer, no synovial thickening, and just a little bit of fluid in it. <laughs> the shoulder is not the primary joint that's affected, is it, John? Uh, for rheumatoid arthritis, usually not. Uh, we we yeah. actually, you know, back when we first started doing MR to look, to look for which we proved was much more sensitive technique than other imaging tools. Uh, there was a group in Arizona, and then our group out here in California. And the group in Arizona, we decided we'd divide joints up uh, to try to get a study done faster. So. Uh, they wanted to take the foot because if you use x-rays, uh, the foot, uh, the small joints of the, you know, meta, 
tarsophalangeal joints are the most sensitive joints for detecting early uh, erosions in rheumatoid arthritis because they're actually smaller bones. So you can see the erosion easier. Uh, so they left us with the hands and wrists, uh, and it turned out that the disease is generally much earlier in the hands and wrists than it is in the feet, and we, we got a, a lot more pathology than they did. Uh, so it kind of backfired on them. But uh, uh, a lot of joints can be involved with rheumatoid arthritis, but I think the, the most common earliest joints are really the hand and wrist. Uh, and they and, and, and the knee is a yeah. Uh, Marmer and I probably did a two or three thousand synovectomies of various joints. Yeah, uh, shoulder was not uh, very common that we yeah. did. Right. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is what we found once we had a much more sensitive technique than X rays is that early on, uh, it's almost always the disease is asymmetric. And in the old days, if you had asymmetry, that kind of ruled out rheumatoid arthritis. And that's, well, you know, I'm going to talk about this when we get to the, to the uh, rheumatoid. Yeah. Talk. And we'll talk about the different criteria through the, through the years and how that had to be changed uh, about the same time that MR came along. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm going to skip it here. And we'll have a whole lecture on that later. Okay. So we have a 34 year old female with increasing pain seven months after rotator cuff repair and rule out infection. Uh, I see a large effusion, uh, some synovial debris uh, kind of throughout. Uh, and again, this is all synovial thickening, right? Mm -hmm. It's really useful. There's a little bit of an effusion, but this is almost all synovial thickening mm -hmm. uh, rather than fluid. See, the patient's had surgery here, mm -hmm. had a rupture cuff up here, and this is another case of refractive uh, problem with the rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, patient has chronic shoulder pain and I think we are looking at a coronal view and that it looks like it might be the possibly the biceps tendon. Yeah, like, so this is this is a scapula. Oh okay. Okay. So up through the lungs. So you have a lot of fluid and soft tissue thickening in here where it shouldn't be. So so what do you think is going on here? So that's probably uh, that might be some bursitis. Um sub okay. uh so so this is this this bursa here is called the scaphothoracic bursa. Okay. Right. No the, the uh, scapulothoracic bursa. Scapulothoracic, yeah. okay. Uh, <clears throat> why do you think you might have bursitis here? Um, scapulothoracic, I mean, you do have a lot of movement What's there. This? That might be the... Uh, subscapularis muscle so this is a patient who has a, an old osteochondroma involving the scapula it happens to be in a very bad location uh, and every time he moves the scapula then he's irritating all this the soft tissues here along the uh let's see if i can do it right this time scapulothoracic uh bursa uh and uh, so this is actually a bursitis due to mechanical irritation from a chronic osteochondroma. So it shows that uh, you can get bursitis from trauma, and I think that some of the uh, subacromial subdeltoid bursitis we see can come from trauma from osteophytes from the acromion process. And here's what it looks like in the axial plane.
Okay. This is a miserable place to operate on. Yeah. Uh, you you want to call, call another orthopedic surgeon who's uh, been around a while to okay. do this kind of surgery. Okay. Okay, now the flu shot went to the bone. Um, sure, sure I do see some. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, I do see focal uh, edema in the humeral head posterior laterally. Uh, yeah, so so this was an inflammatory reaction. When you give flu shots, if any of you guys do in your next jobs, <laughs> like I do around here, uh, you don't want to inject the bone or the periosteum because that can produce an inflammatory reaction that can be painful and takes a while to, to resolve. Uh, they went ahead and treated this with antibiotics, but this almost certainly, it was probably not infectious. <clears throat> but I guess one possibility, instead of an, infl as an allergic uh, type reaction, uh, could be that uh, they might have injected some bacteria at the time, but most likely it's probably a reaction to the uh, uh, to the flu shot from the bone and periosteum. Instead of muscle, that 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 injection was too low. Any, I mean, too high anyway. Um, whoever did it. Okay, nineteen-year-old. Pain after a fall. Looks like maybe in the humeral neck, there's like this lucent lesion. Little sclerosis around it, sharply defined mm -hmm. in the metaphysis. Here's what the MR looks like. Yeah, on the PD fat set, um, it looks like fluid. Um, not sure. It could be fluid here on the T two. Okay. And it looks like it's been there for a while because you do have a bony reaction mm -hmm. with uh, a little bit of thickening of the trabecular bone around it, a little bit of sclerosis. So it's probably something that's chronic. Uh, what does this look like? Well, what would you say this would be if you saw it in the distal metaphysis of the femur in a teenager? Oh, uh, NOF. Um, uh, metaphysis. Distal. Meta anyway, so typically it's a cortical neuron. It starts with a B. Yeah, this is a Brody's abscess. So, and then uh, quite commonly, uh, this will be the typical history you'll get for Brody's abscess because uh, uh, they. They just notice the pain after a fall. Everybody thinks about a fracture, so you bring them in, and, but they've had it for a year or more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but uh, once the diagnosis is made and the proper antibiotics are given, these have a pretty good prognosis, especially at this stage when the growth plate is all fused. Okay. Well, the thing about that area that that doesn't, that's uh, uh, not cortical bone, and so. Their pain fibers are not very. Uh, yeah, well, probably none of them there. Right. And so, so they can tolerate that. If there's any mild pain, that's about all you get. And that's why it got so large without the patient uh, winding up in the emergency room. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so we have a six-year-old female with fever and shoulder pain for one week. Uh, looks like there's a large fluid collection, I want to say, in that shoulder deltoid muscle. Um, yeah. yeah Margins are a little bit indistinct. Mm -hmm. Edges are a little bit thickened here. Mm -hmm. so, and this was a step aureus abscess. Yeah. That's a pretty common age group for that. Um, 62 year old male with shoulder pain for 10 days. So, within the supraspinatus muscle, we see a uh, centrally 
or we see like a uh, collection that has like a thin um, margin and it looks like it's probably a uh, intramuscular abscess within the supraspinatus muscle. Uh, and then we see he had some joint fluid as well. So they stuck a needle into the bursa here and got pus out. Oh, so it's a bursa. Um, all right, so I think somewhere around the supraspinatus footprint is uh, our area of concern. Some increased signal there. Uh, I don't know if there's uh, retraction on the muscle yeah. in this junction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have some overlying bursitis and uh, subscapularis. Okay, so this retraction is this is eight three eleven. Okay. So it looks like a patient has a rotator cuff tear, right? Yeah. Okay, and some chronic changes here, the greater tuberosity. Okay, so what happened? Now, see, this is 8.3. Now we're on 11.22, a few months later. All right, so I don't think the construct of the supraspinatus repair is intact. It uh, looks like the tendons are trapped yeah, look at all this stuff. Yeah, there. and then get some. Looks like a double row. Are we getting a uh, reaction to the uh, suture anchor? Okay, that's possible. Okay. It turned out this was an infection. Okay. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so here we can see the, the tear and the chronic traction changes there. And then here, <laughs> a couple of things that we see with this certainly is <clears throat> a tear of the construct. More, much more proximal retraction of the musculotendinous junction, big defect here. Also, <clears throat> this is now about two and a half months after the surgery. There's still a lot of edema around the bone. And generally, you shouldn't have this much of edema this far out around the bone. And there's actually some fluid here uh, uh, in, and around it. And then if you look at the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, look at all this synovial thickening. And that you don't normally see after, after uh, successful surgery. And there's even a lot of stuff around the sub, subscap here. Uh, and this was a, a, a basically an abscess. I see in one case I was two years old, but that was in the knee. Wow. An acute onset. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so here arm pain after surgery. Looks like they had a uh, shoulder replacement. Um, just... Well, that's not a replacement. That's a single. Uh, yeah, it's, it's what, a... what? What is it? Basically, so you're going to single component thesis, single component, yeah. okay. right? Um, but it's not for... situated properly in the glenoid, right? Yeah, no, it's riding, riding high. Yeah. And you know, it's a little hard to see it. These soft tissues aren't normal. So, here's what the CT looks like. Yeah, so we have so this CT is, uh, yeah, after they treated it. Okay. So we have these, looks like calcifications, these rounded calcifications in the, I'm not sure, is it in the muscle? Is it in the. What, what's happened here is that this has gotten infected. Oh, okay. And we've got actually big abscesses here. They oh. went in and had to, to take out the prosthesis. And then look at the, how, what the bone looks like here. Mm -hmm. Now look what the bone looks like here. So they had to remove the prosthesis. And then these are antibiotic, antibiotic oh. beads that they put in. So you have a slow release of antibiotic over a long period of time to try to treat it. And then hopefully get rid of the infection, which is very difficult in situations like this. 
and try to do something for the patient after the infection is, is finished, but these are antibiotic beads. The main thing is to get rid of the infection so the patient doesn't die. Right. All right, so we have a weight lifter, severe pain after water skiing. Uh, yeah. Not seeing a whole lot here. I should have stayed on land. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so here, you you just don't see the soft tissue planes here very well. It looks like it's probably thick, and you know, maybe he's got a big delta in the weight lifter. Uh, so if we go to the MR, Study here, this is what it looks like. Uh, so there's like decreased signal kind of overlying that region, and then there's edema. I think that bursa is a little large. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. See? And then this MR scan was interpreted as a rotator cuff tear. Hmm. And here's some more images here. Uh -huh. I think the patient is running a fever. <laughs> uh, so here, so, I mean, this isn't your run-of-the-mill rotator right. cuff tear, right? Right. Obviously, this is an infectious lecture here. Uh, so what happened is they, they admitted the patient to the hospital. Then they called me and asked me to look at the MR scan from the outside. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the, about the same time, they, they also decided that they had to tap this. And this turned out to be a Staph aureus arthritis and septus. And this patient almost died, even though he was a young, healthy male uh, otherwise. Uh, but uh, so uh, infections happen. And uh, uh, they don't really know the source of this infection, but he must have somehow gotten staph aureus and had a bacteremia and it just landed in his subacromial subdeltoid bursa here. Probably as toxic about now. Yeah, he he was very toxic. They actually were very concerned that he, he might not make it, but he did. Okay, what's next? So three weeks of increasing pain. So See some edema in the cranial bed, and then that there's some subacromial subdeltoid fluid on high intensity, and maybe some thickening. Probably a lot of edema in the deltoid. Yeah, so and then thing. there as well, and then maybe the, I'm not sure, maybe the subscap, actually in all the kind of shoulder region. So, this might be like bursitis with extension into the musculature. So, like my so, so, what are these things? Hmm. Those look like uh, uh, could be like metallic fragments of some sort. Like, how about air? Oh, so uh, it's uh, like an advertisement. So those are gas bubbles. Okay. So what would you be worried about if they're gas bubbles? That could be gas within an abscess or uh, like an abscess. So this was an anaerobic infection. These are very serious with a very high mortality rate. So when you see that, uh, you got to get on the phone and the, the patients have to be uh, drained and treated immediately. They gotta get it because these are uh, these can be very dangerous infections. All right, fifty nine year old male, right shoulder pain. Had a rotator cuff tear three years ago. Tore it again, two thousand eleven to two thousand eleven, <laughs> <laughs> and then he has aggravation of his right shoulder pain. Okay. Um, uh, low AC disease, some surgical tracts, uh, greater tuberosity. Uh, 
All right, well, the distal part of the construct looks okay. Um, but yeah, myotendinous region, I don't see much uh, muscle anymore. Um, all right, so... So this is uh, December 19th, 2011. This is March 27th, 2012. There, minus the bone here to here, and lose the bone there. All right, so yeah, we have a an, an erosion of superior medial humeral head. So this really looked like a, a big impaction fracture, okay. right? A lot of edema here, m more soft tissue thickening, gematosynovitis. Uh, uh, Tear and retraction of the rotator cuff yeah. here, as you can see. This is on March 27th. Now we go to April 29th. Uh, yeah, so chronic post-traumatic change of the superior medial humeral head. The effusion has multiple calcific right. densities within it. So now let me go back for a second. If... Let's assume this is an infection, since we're talking about infections. <laughs> if this were a staph aureus or a strep, uh, the patient would probably have been dead by now. Yeah. So what would your differential be at this point when you see all this destructive bone disease and eventually you see all this calcification within the synovium? Like a... Marked, but the patient's still alive. Like so what mycobacterial kind of... or... Well, that fungal? would be good. Yeah, yeah. So this was Canada... And a Canada infection. Okay. So this was a fungal infection. Yeah. And uh, they grew out the, the agent. Okay. And then that's the reconstruction surgery. That's a fusion. Yeah. Okay, 73, shoulder pain for two months. Um... The ultrasound on the right, we see looks like sub subdeltoid, submacromial fluid. Um, right, so on the PD fat set, I think in the middle coronal, we see yeah fluid there. Um, that's that's a bursa, isn't it? Y yeah. Yeah, I think so. And then there's it's not just fluid, right? It's much more complex. Right. We we see synovial thickening. I think that's a post contrast image on the right. So yeah, synovial thickening. And right. Again, this looks very infectious, right? Mm-hmm. You can see the arrow. And this was tuberculous bursitis. Very common in the east. Yeah. All right, so we have a 56-year-old right shoulder resting pain and weakness, remote onset one year ago, uh, recent onset five months ago, pain, dull, limited range of motion, uh, muscle atrophy, tenderness. Uh, great, is that great intro uh, Let's see. It looks like there's a lot of fatty atrophy of the, was it the infraspinatus, supraspinatus, and even subscap maybe. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of fatty atrophy again. Uh, EMG. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. There. Post polio syndrome. Hmm. So we actually had one of these here a couple of weeks ago. Oh, wow. So uh, when you see this kind of atrophy, and it would important well, would be very helpful to see that you don't see this on the other side. Uh, but this looks like very chronic, mature fatty atrophy of the muscles, and uh, in a in a uh, in a regional distribution like this, this is very typical of uh, poliomyelitis. And you might think, well, that doesn't exist anymore. But we had a case. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago here in, in Southern California. So it's uh, it's something you can still see. 
uh, polio. And we uh, made an accurate diagnosis before we actually found out that it was correct. We got a lot of people crossing the border, John. It's gonna, we're gonna <laughs> have a lot more of these. Well, okay. okay. This would be unilateral, the polio? Yes. Yes. Almost always. So we have a 65 year old female localized multiple well defined erythematous nodules on the right arm for one year. And then we have an MRI. So in the subcutaneous tissues lateral to the deltoid, we see some soft tissue nodules. And then. So they're low signal in T1. Here's in T2. Oh, okay, so they're low signal in T1 and then they're high signal in T2. So they might be little fluid collections. or uh, maybe lymph nodes. Or... In, uh, the patients in Korea, basically Asia, uh, this is a really chronic sort of thing. And usually it comes with the history that the patient ate raw snake. I mean, it could be, uh, I don't know. This is for diagnosis. Okay. Uh, I'm not aware of it being in the U.S., uh, but this is a parasite, and the intermediate host. Uh, kimchi. You get this from kimchi? You certainly can get anything from kimchi oh, where, okay. when I was there. <laughs> when you were there. Okay. Uh, that was in 64, so. Yeah, uh, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, yeah, but so. still out there in the farms, they still put this cabbage stuff in the ground rather than in a cement uh, type of a yeah pot. Okay. I used to see that stuff up sitting out there in the street, and they pick it up. Yeah like garbage and throw it in a truck and then go to the pots uh just throw it in the dirt with uh whatever else they could do with it when i was a uh, freshman when i was a freshman never tasted it oh well when i was a freshman in college my roommate was a korean who grew up in japan and when he got there for some reason, during the winter, he decided he was going to make kimchi in our bathroom. And uh, the smell almost got us kicked out of the door. It was awful. I'll never forget that. And the only thing that was worse was eating it. <laughs> and he loved it. Uh, anyway, so what do you think here, Jason? Uh, did the person inject the flu shot into the supraspinatus and bursa. So we can see a lot of fusion, polysynovial thickening involving the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. See a lot of edema within the supraspinatus and a big uh, joint effusion here, right? Yeah. And uh, this is what it looked like a few years earlier. Uh, so if there was a change there, probably a lot of tendinopathy, maybe even a partial tear on the prior study, and that's gotten worse, but we have a lot more edema, and this is probably a vaccine-related inflammatory change again. So why don't we stop here, and we will continue looking at inflammatory lesions going forward, okay? Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. See you, John.